Okay. Good morning, everybody. Hello, good morning. My name's Chris Morrison. And my name's Jane Secker. So we're the uh, co-chairs of the uh, Association for Learning Technology, Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group. And this is the 54th webinar we've run on yep. online learning at a time of uncertainty. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a journey. It's been a journey, it continues yeah, to be a journey. It does, it's, yes. And it's great to be here with it you is. again today. And we are wearing our Ice Pops t-shirts today. Uh, Feeling like being festive red. Festive Some people said red. these were very Christmassy, these t-shirts. Yeah, they are a bit Christmassy. We, we maybe should have, but... we can talk about, let's not talk about Christmas, <laughs> not yet. Um, so yes, what have we got today? And another excellent lineup. We uh, have, things. yeah. What have we got? Uh, so there's some copyright news, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll talk about. We've got a new waffle out, new podcast, very exciting, some good events. Uh, but the the main event today, we'll be talking to David and Zoe. I think we've misspelled David's name there, so apologies for that. Uh, we'll come back to that later. Oh. Who are authors uh, of chapters in the Navigating Copyright for Libraries book that we've mentioned on the uh, webinar before yeah. and we're going to have an excellent opportunity to to ask two of the authors about um, their chapters. Absolutely. So what have we been up to since we last met then Chris? It's, it's okay. been a quiet time hasn't it? Not much going on, Not nothing nothing on that slide. We've just, just been waiting for things <laughs> to load really. I think that's been our experience hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether yeah. everybody else can see the content. Um, there we go! Right. <laughs> it's been honours all round. Honours all round. So this was First one is you getting your honorary doctorate from the Open University. It was, yes. Wow. It was on the 4th of November in Brighton. Yeah. We we're trying to work out if I was on the same stage where ABBA performed Waterloo, aren't we? In 1974 at the Eurovision Song Contest. Yes, I, I, I was very... I wasn't watching Your it. costume is kind of similarly... Uh, <laughs> flamboyant. flamboyant and colourful yes. but um well done to you thank you that. i'm thank sorry you. i couldn't be there there is there so congratulations all around to, to jane um and we've got blog post about that that i've just published yes and that's so selena well. who took that selfie when we were on the stage yeah um and she she's the associate director at the ou library and mm. read out a very lovely speech about me it's very embarrassing because i had to stand there while everyone wondered who on earth I was. I was quite disappointed I wasn't Ronan Keating because okay. the uh, vice chancellor had just mentioned that he'd given one to Ronan Keating yeah. and everyone wanted a selfie. Okay. So I had to apologise, not for the first time, you for know, not being for Keating. not being Ronan Keating. <laughs> yes. yes. But you you had a similarly overwhelming experience online on Zoom at the Silip ADM. Yes. Uh, I was did, you, did you apologise for not being... Um, you know, uh, Carol, Gary, Gary Barlow. Carol had one of them, I think. So this was the uh, honorary fellowship of Silip, which I was very uh, pleased to have been awarded. It is the highest recognition. It was very nice for those in the information profession. A shame that it was, as we can see from the picture, on Zoom. Yes. Um, it would have been nice, but I, I definitely do intend to catch up with the other people from Silip, and, mm. and I'm very honoured to have been given that. Um, yeah. Yes, yes, no, fantastic. I really think great. what it means is I can walk into any library in the country and they have to open the special biscuits. That's what I believe. <laughs> in. I haven't checked that out yet. But, uh, <laughs> the special biscuits. We'll see, we'll see. Okay, that's okay. enough. Enough of this. Yeah, what, enough what, what, this yeah. is just to remind you that we have uh, an archive of all of the um, webinars, all the previous recordings available on our website, and the, the content is also on the YouTube channel. Seamlessly, seamlessly, seamlessly I, can I can do it. I think we just need somebody else to do all the copying and pasting. If anyone's happy to volunteer to do the copying and pasting, it might uh, make things go a bit more smoothly. And what's Steve uh, sharing in YouTube? He's put a link to something in YouTube. Is that our channel? Or is that something else? Uh, not sure. Um, right, so let's move on to the next uh, slide. Yes. Next slide, please. Um, copyright news. It's time it's for a time jingle. For a bit of copyright news. I, yeah. Line it up, line it up. Right, copyright news. Okay. 
Um, so we've got a new podcast out. This is really exciting. This uh, is. This is great. Um, so um, over the summer, we um, were very honoured to chat to the internet act activist, um, the sci-fi writer, Corey Doctorow, um, somebody who I'd actually heard him speak in Brighton, actually, on the stage yeah. at the Silic Conference quite a yeah. few years ago. Um, but I've followed his work for some time. Um, he is uh, a very avid um, user of different social media platforms, blogs, all sorts of things. But he also had just written a book um, that he's touring at the moment with uh, Rebecca Giblin, who's from the Authors Alliance. She's done a lot of work on ebook pricing. Um, and um, their book is called Choke Point Capitalism. Um, really uh, fascinating book. We actually had a, a talk when we were up in Glasgow as well at the Create Conference from them mm -hmm. about the book. Um, so he talks to us in the podcast about uh, the book, but he also talks about copyright literacy. He talks about mm -hmm. the role that librarians play that he thinks is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and he talks um, about the way uh, the, the big tech kind of works and the way he thinks it should work and and, and we talk about pixie don't we as well we and yeah. the practice of, of the the kind of use of creative commons licenses where people are sort of trying to extract money out of you if you don't attribute them yeah it's a brilliant conversation i was really pleased those of you who are on copy seek the discussion this see that i was posting to it not just for self-promotion but actually because a lot of what he was talking about really hits the nail on the head of some of those fundamental underlying challenges about copyright. Uh, so that was uh, a fantastic um, Yeah, really, really good. Yeah, yeah. So do check it out. Um, Next up. This yeah. is a news item that we picked up with friend of the webinar, uh, Claudie Opden Camp, who is uh, a lecturer at uh, Bournemouth. So we've worked with Claudie on our uh, codes of fair practice in film education project. Mm. But this is uh, a, an incredible experience for her as a researcher of both film and copyright to have found what they are referring to as the big bang of cinema, the first documentary evidence copyright registration of an audiovisual work. Um, so we thought that might be interesting to those of you who are also into film and copyright. Mm. Um, She's been digging around at the Library of Congress. Yes, she, found this, she has she? Been, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's the kind of thing researchers do, I believe. I know. Spend time in, in, in libraries. libraries. Yeah, well, um, they probably don't get the special biscuits, though. No, not like, not like you. So. No, no. no, um, no. So, well, yeah, well done to Cloudy, and that's, that's, that was an interesting story. So what else have we got? Um, a, a, a webinar coming up and there's lots of talk about rights retention for those of you who are uh, involved in open access questions what does it mean for this particular route for making uh, publications available open access uh, so some excellent speakers here chaired uh, by sally rumsey I think, by isn't sally it? Rumsey, yeah, yeah. Um, is peter, 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 Su peter suber actually joining it as well yes yeah, yeah. wow so, um, I am uh, going to be going to that one yeah definitely because we're yeah. doing rights retention stuff um, uh, at, uh, at Oxford. Yeah. Which is all good. And then our last item is um, another one that's slow to load, but this is a webinar coming up um, on the uh, 21st of November when it ever loads. I'll put a link into the chat, but it's organised by uh, Knowledge, Knowledge Rights 21. Um, so they've been doing a lot of events. This one is about how do we fix the ebook market, a discussion on the future of libraries and authorship. Um, so that looks like a great session um, taking place next week, uh, Monday um, at two o'clock. Um, I, I think with all of these, um, if you can't make them, a lot of them are all being recorded. So um, they're worth uh, having a look at anyway, just you know, so you can, mm -hmm. you can follow it. But yeah, that, that looks like a great session. Okay, so without further ado, we um, are um, speaking today about the um, the IFLA um, book that's called that came out over the summer, um, published open access, navigating copyright for libraries. Um, Chris and I um, have already talked about this book briefly um, because we wrote a chapter in it. Um, chapter thirteen, no less. Which I don't lucky, know for that, lucky for some. Lucky for some. Um, we're not going to talk about our chapter, but our chapter. We could talk about it at some point if I anyone's think, I think interested. We will, yeah, I think yeah. we should at some point. But yeah, anyway, yeah. Not but our chapter is about the relationship between copyright education and information literacy. But the whole book um, has got 20 <laughs> chapters 
Um, if you haven't yet um, had a look at it, I'd highly recommend it. Um, you can you can download the PDF um, in its entirety. You can buy a print copy if you want a print copy. Uh, a coffee, a coffee, a coffee. It's, no. A print copy. We're still waiting for ours. <laughs> yes, I think, no, I think maybe it's David and Zoe are as well, but yes, yeah. they, they do exist. Yeah. Uh, we, we um, uh, but, you know, one, one of the things we thought would be great, because there's so many fascinating chapters in there, would be to get um, some of the authors from the the different chapters to join us on the webinar. So this is the first in a series of two. We're yeah. going to be doing a second webinar with some other authors joining us. But today, who have we got, Chris? So tell so, us about our panel. So we have David Meehan, who is Associate Director, Special Collections and Archives at the O'Reilly Library in D Dublin City University. And, and David's chapter is about the application of limitations and exceptions to copyright across the European Union. So a really important subject and because of the recent directive uh, or directives that have come out in Europe. So we're going to be uh, really interested to dig into some of those and how they are being applied in Ireland, across Europe, but also in, in, in university libraries. Um, and our other guest is uh, Dr. Zoe Krokida, who's a lecturer in intellectual property law um, and uh, EU law at the University of Stirling. So Zoe's chapter is about the use of filtering technologies by online intermediaries. Um, so an area of great uh, uh, controversy mm. and intense debate because of its wide reaching implications for how people share um, and access content online. So two really great topics, two that clearly have some strong uh, links to each other for how uh, libraries and educational institutions operate their services. So yeah. we're delighted to have both of you joining us today. Thank you so much. So hello, David. Hello, Zoe. Hi. Jane, Chris, how are you? Hello, thank you so much for the invitation. Not a problem. Great to have you. So um, if, if I can just start, um, I, I think what would be great would be to hear from a bit of, from both of you about how you got involved in the book. Maybe, um, a, you know, how, how did you come to write the chapter? So, David, do you want to just go first? Maybe just tell us a bit sure about um, your, your chapter is on the limitations and exceptions um, that apply to libraries. So and yeah. Well, I suppose, uh, uh, apart from my day job, I'm also uh, the chair of the Regulatory Affairs Group on Connell, which is a consortium of um, Irish University Research Libraries. So we deal with, uh, as a matter of course, uh, a lot of copyright, other stuff as well, but it tends to be mainly copyright. And I was there kind of um, minding my own business in the day job and, and in the Regulatory <laughs> Affairs Group when I got an email uh, that um, so, uh, uh, somebody apparently had kind of pulled out <laughs> and they needed a chapter fast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got cracking on it and um, produced a couple of drafts and uh, so you're, you're uh, good at writing things quickly <laughs> I, well, the, the thing was I, I, I was I was kind of a li liaising with the 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 editor uh, going reasonably well but like can you be a little quicker because uh, we want to get this show on the road get the book out yeah and I got and it kind of ruined a summer on me but uh, you know as it was oh. <laughs> <laughs> last summer um, uh, um especially the evenings uh, towards the end uh, and yeah. but anyway i got it done got it in and then when i submitted my manuscript i was told i was one of the first people to submit so, <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> so uh, but look look at it doesn't matter it kind of in a way it eased the pain because it, it forced me to scrunch everything up into a relatively sh short time time scale of about nine months which yeah. doesn't sound that short at all. So yeah, there we go. That's how I got on board, and uh, so okay. I like to do it because I have a little bit of a, a background, a legal background anyway. Uh, I, I yeah. studied I studied law, and I worked in in Brussels uh, for a few years and in Berlin as well in uh, ah. private in private sector like in, in, for a law firm and then also for a university institute. So I, yeah. I had a good background in European law, not copyright at all, but European law. Uh, yeah. So I kind of understood yeah. the, the basic framework of, of, of uh, you know, European legislation, how laws operate, especially yeah. how they interact with member states, that kind of a thing. So I wasn't a bad candidate to write this chapter at all. OK, great. And, and Zoe, you're a lecturer in intellectual property law um, at Sterling, aren't you? So um, presumably you got something similar, an email 
saying, well, not ones hopefully saying, oh, someone's dropped out. Can you be the first reserve? <laughs> and, and well, um, I will tell you how, uh, how, um, how, how, how did that happen? So my research interests lie on internet service providers liability for copyright infringements. And part yeah. of my research is also on filtering tools, all these upload filters that online platforms, yeah. uh, some of them are already using and some of them my, you are, are developing now and um, also part of my research was all, all these implications that um, that all these filtering tools might have for users fundamental rights so one day when I, re I received an email from IFLA asking about a chapter uh, if I would be willing to write a chapter on filtering obligations and I accepted immediately <laughs> so this was <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, it, 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 well, we'll come into it more. I, I really actually enjoyed your chapter and uh, I, I learned a lot about how some of the technologies work as well. But let, let's come to that in a, mo in a moment. David, if we can go to you first, I wondered, because um, your chapter um, is about um, the limitations and exceptions. I mean, don't I don't want you to go through it kind of like page by page, but um, you know, you, you, what you're trying to do is actually it's quite ambitious in a way because you've got to try to summarise them across Europe and then how they apply to, to libraries, haven't you? So do you want to say a bit about how, how you went about that? Yeah, pr pretty much. Well, I suppose you, your starting point is your, your national perspective and all of us here would have national perspectives. And I think a lot of the copyright regimes in, in nation states are, are pretty advanced. I mean, it's been the, the, the groundwork was done a long time ago, like internationally, is even the late 1800s, there was, uh, uh, you know, principles being established. And it's, an, it's turned into an iterative, iterative process. And in, in a sense, what the European Union is trying to do is it's trying to establish, you know, the, the framework um, of all the exceptions that typically apply, and we all we all pretty much understand them, I think, uh, intuitively, because uh, we've been operating for so long, and it's been trying to uh, create a common common type of system so that there's no real huge variances between the various member states. So that was, if you like, one one particular goal was to try and put a bit of manners on that and to try and get that across to people. That really, it's mm. not that it's not as bad as it seems when you look at it at first hand. And really, if mm. you've got any, any way, a kind of a half decent national regime, uh, there's nothing too much to be afraid of. That would be like the, the introductory part of it. But the, then you know, towards, as I went through, especially towards the end, I started to consider more of the things that are uh, a bit more topical, like what's, uh, what's actually coming up on the European agenda now. Things that have settled, leave that to one side and uh, like maybe focus a little bit on, on the, the digital shift. And I spent a yeah. little bit of time talking about that too. Uh, that's probably the thing that's of most topical interest to people, but it's also very, very real, very, very real kind of a kind of a change that's taking place. That's really kind of if you like the context without going into the chapter itself and then because there's a lot of de there is a lot of detail in the chapter. But I, I was yeah. able to reduce into the end down to themes. Maybe in a different world, you might have done a different chapter. Uh, taking the, the 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 changes that are taking place and, and trying to discuss those in more detail, but that that wasn't the brief. Yeah, yeah, because you you do pick up, don't you, on uh, the digital single market directive, and I think there's a couple of countries where they look to implement it, and you talked about that. I mean, how far would you say it is going to? Do you think it's going to be successful at trying to harmonise? Um, exceptions across Europe. You know, when we're thinking of, you know, cross-border education, it's it's you know, it is something that concerns yeah. people. The one thing the EU says is that they're not trying to codify the law. Uh, uh, that's one thing, base, base principle. And what they're doing is they're basically basically letting people go about doing things their own way. So we would have a lot of, in a lot of countries, we'd have collection management organisations, like in England, you'd have the CLA, the Copyright Licensing Agency. Mm. I think I think a lot of the the the, the day to day stuff is is covered by that. And in, in some ways, there's probably not a huge amount of a need for libraries to worry too much about about things that are happening in European law. So if you take the Digital uh, uh, Services uh, the, the Directive. The digital, sorry, the digital single market directive uh, from a couple yes. years back. Uh, they, that's really just suggesting uh, well a few changes like uh, text and da data mining. So if libraries are active in liaising with researchers and want to pursue an active role in that, or if it's even just a simple advisory role, they will probably they're dealing with something very, very, very specialised, and and they probably know and understand that the terms and conditions of <laughs> engaging with that themselves. So there's pro there's probably it, it's not something that can be addressed very, very generically. It's something that people deal with in a very, very specialised basis. You've got other kind of elements then as well. You would have um, uh, the 
the cross-border uh, education. Again, that's largely covered to an extent by the CMO operation. There's, there's, there's a compensation involved, and where there's compensation involved, money has to be got from the libraries and given to the to the the, 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 the rights holders, and that tends to be again um, managed by the by the CMOs, by the, the by the CLA, by the ICLA, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, it, it, in one sense. What you're doing there is you're being given some kind of cover there because if you remember back in the old days, old days with, with the, the photocopying uh, or the printing off, especially the photocopying, uh, you 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 just you were just looking for cover really. So when your library was paying the, the the fee to the CLA, whatever you knew, you were kind of covered. And unless somebody was egregiously breaking the rules, you were all right. And it's probably a similar thing with the, in the digital world. It's once you do things online with the the, the VLEs, the, the virtual learning environments. Um, it's not so much of a problem when you're dealing with that on your campus, but now that a lot of uh, uh, institutions have an international footprint, um, they're uh, putting their uh, courses on VLEs, making resources available through VLEs, and that they now are finding because of this legislation, they have some amount of cover to, to be able to do that. They're, they can pr proceed with confidence and just do their normal thing. So probably not a huge amount to worry about there as far as the that is concerned. There's a couple of other aspects of the DSM. Don't want to go through them unless people want to ask specifically about them. Uh, but uh, I, I'm kind of thinking the uh, the, the one about uh, what the 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 uh, items, grey literature, uh, copying those, but that tends to be dealt with by the heritage institutions more than say research libraries. Yeah. So I think one of the things that your chapter does very well is is gives that sense of you know the overarching intention of trying to harmonise those laws across the different member states but the inevitable complexity that happens when you're trying to take all these different traditions of countries have those, you know, um, as you say, some collective management with remuneration and others that don't, um, clearly UK not in that mix anymore. Oh. <laughs> we can get the lights to come back on. Um, <laughs> but what I'm interested in is picking up another thing that adds to that complexity, of course, as well, is the, the case law and what happens when a particular case is brought in a, in a European Union member state, and then they ask those questions of the, 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 the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, and then how those filter back down. Um, one of the cases that you talk about is the uh, Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany, and the looking at how um, exceptions and limitations apply when a library is digitizing their collections in order to make them available to readers, to researchers, to students at their institution. Um, so can you tell us a bit about how, how that is playing out in the new legislative environment, how a decision like that is, is how, how, what impact is it happening in, in your institution, in your country, in Ireland and across the EU? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. That, like, because uh, what, what the you've got these kind of formula that appear in uh, European directives, such as like you know, new forms of exploitation, they very much accept that the world has changed. Uh, we were moving from print to digital, and right back as far as 2000, they were they were taken down on board, and that's uh, been picked up uh, uh, in case law as well. So you mentioned the TU Darmstadt case. That's a technical university that uh, I, I, I think it was a test case. I think what they were doing was they probably sat down and thought, this is something we should be allowed to do. Let's pick a hard case and, and throw it at the, the, the throw it at our, our national court and see what happens. And uh, they digitized a, a book uh, that was in their collections. It was a textbook. It wouldn't be something that people would normally do, to be honest, I don't think. Uh, um, uh, and then they made it available on a dedicated terminal, which is a very, very limited form of access. Uh, and uh, that was tested in the court. The court said, of course you can do that. There's, there's no problem. You're, you've got a, 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 there's a right to put to, to use dedicated terminals, and therefore there's a corollary right to digitize, digitize to put something on, on, on a terminal. So uh, the, if the, uh, that was, if you like, the, the basic facts of the case, but also uh, the publishers who were not happy with this uh, said, look, we, we gave you guys the option of, of uh, uh, a digital subscription to the same book, and you didn't pick it up. So uh, um, you know, back down. The Technical University said, oh, we you know that the, the law states a certain uh, 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 right, and the court basically supports them. The yeah. court said, yeah, actually, you know, you, you don't actually have to take up a digital subscription. So not only can you digitize a book in your collections, um, but uh, you're not obliged to take up the digital equivalent, which is, as we often find out, very, very expensive. Mm. So 
that if like they establish a principle there, but what does that how does that what does that mean in practice? It's very very hard to say because uh, even if you've got, you've got the right to digitize uh, a textbook, like how many books are you going to actually go out and digitize? I mean, there's the cost, the practical cost of digital is very very expensive. How do you mediate it? You have to have a system for providing access, and uh, a digital uh, uh, sorry dedicated terminal is a very very controlled method of access, but that's not useful in the internet age. People want to be able to access from their own devices. So like the, I suppose the next question is there is a question corollary question to that that wasn't addressed in T Darmstadt, but like can you actually convert in some way uh, access th through a dedicated term to access the internet in a little bit along mm. the lines of the VOB case, the, the Dutch case, which allowed you to, uh, uh, to digitally lend that the uh, manual, uh, manual lending is the same as digital lending, is, is a digital access through a device controlled digital access the same as through a controlled uh, 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 dedicated terminal. Absolutely. And that question in the, in the VOB case is central to whether controlled digital lending um, is something that, that has uh, traction in, in the European Union. Is there, is there the legal justification for it? Do libraries feel confident in, in relying on, on the law there? Mm. Um, so is that something that you were looking into when you were putting together your your chapter. Yeah, look, I looked at that too because uh, I thought, uh, again, it's it's the court is addressing these issues, but the court isn't the same. Like a court judgment isn't the same as a piece of legislation. Legislation tends to have very very general coverage. Courts deal with very very specific facts. Mm -hmm. So the VOB case, uh, the Dutch case, uh, that concerned uh, public libraries, and uh, uh, so the, this whole thing about uh, controlled digital lending, it, it, strictly speaking, only applies to uh, public libraries. I'd make the case that actually it has wider application, but that's not that wasn't addressed by the court. The court didn't get clearance on that, and there's no legislation on that. And this whole CDL thing uh, is 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 more like an IFLA uh, um, initiative. The thing mm. about the the own to loan ratio that's uh, it's in paper paper they've written, but it's not in any legislation and it's not really existing in, a, in any court ca case that I'm aware of. So there's a bit of a gap. I think there's a, personally, I think the risk is low. I, I, I don't see why a, a research, a, a, an academic library couldn't do something that a, a, a public library couldn't do. Yeah. Although there is a different legal basis. The public libraries are covered by the public lending right. Uh, university libraries aren't. So there's an economic consideration there. But when you consider mm. how much we pay for our, our books, our academic books are so expensive, maybe there's a, Corollary there that we're actually covering ourselves there. We're giving so much money to the publishers that you know let us do what we want to do. There's certainly <laughs> there's certainly a lot of money involved in it, which is clearly why why we have uh, all yeah. of these challenges to to address. Um, Should we bring Zoe? In? Yeah, Zoe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your so your chapter um, is around the use of filtering technologies by online intermediaries and the legislative framework that. Um, that exists not just in the European Union but around the world and laws that have been developed. So I wonder if you could, could we just start by, can you explain what we're actually talking about with filtering technologies? These are, I think many of us know about YouTube and Content ID, uh, which I think is a fingerprinting uh, filtering technology, but there are other kinds of technologies that fall into different categories. So can you give us a, a bit of an explanation of that? Of course, so there are many types of uh, filtering technology, like uh, simple forms of technology, filtering tools, filtering technology are more sophisticated, like the content ID system. Uh, so, for instance, there is the metadata, uh, which is actually the simplest form of filtering technology that goes along with the work. For instance, metadata is information uh, about the duration of a video, about the title of the book. Um, and in order to identify copyright infringement, uh, we match uh, the metadata of that uh, file against, we, we compare actually the metadata of that file with the metadata of files that exist in a database. And um, this is the simplest form. There are also other forms of uh, filtering technology, such as hashing filtering technology. So hash is a unique um, digital signature for each file. Uh, in order to identify then uh, copyright infringement, we compare the hash of that file against the hashes of files that exist already in, in the database and that have been submitted by the copyright holders. Um, apart from this, there are also other uh, types of uh, filtering technologies such as watermarking. Uh, 
which mm -hmm. places a hidden barcode in, in the files. And these are um, commonly used by the film industry in order to identify, to locate who is actually accessing uh, the films uh, or uh, videos without authorization, without permission. Um, there is the fingerprint-based uh, technology that is used also by, by YouTube and other uh, big uh, tech platforms. Um, that is actually, um, it's, um, it's, it, this, this filtering technology, this fingerprint-based technology identifies um, the inherent characteristics of its file, of its video, and then it, um, it matches the, um, the, the characteristics of that video with um, the a database of files that have been already submitted by the copyright holders. But apart from this uh, filtering technology that are based on audio, uh, video and images, there are also uh, filtering um, types of filtering technology that identify textual infringements. So apart from the metadata and apart from uh, watermarking and fingerprint-based technology, uh, there is, for instance, the natural uh, language processing um, system, uh, filtering technology or the blacklisting technology. They conduct a textual analysis, so a semantic analysis. They examine the, the words in the sentences, the negative or the positive sentiment of the text. Um, and then they try to they see if that text is ma uh, match, matches with the text that is available um, online, uh, that is available in the database or online. So uh, there was a, actually, there is this um, filtering tool developed by Facebook, the Rosetta, uh, technology, the Rosetta uh, te um, software. So, in order to ident try to exact extract text that is available online, so and matches with uh, and extract text and then matches with text that text other texts that are available online. So, apart from all this fingerprint-based technology, as I said, there are also filtering technology that uh, manages to identify uh, textual infringements by making this sophisticated analysis in the text mm -hmm. by categorizing words too. <laughs> So sophisticated analysis, but as you point out in your article, that doesn't actually necessarily align with what is good for society. Machines make mistakes. They can either block too much or they can let things through and we can end up with a situation uh, that is hampering and impacting on people's ability for freedom of expression and, 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 and uh, of commenting uh, and sharing things. So can you talk to us? A bit about the there, there's a tension, isn't there, in in the legislative reform? You've been talking about what happens across in your chapter across different countries um, in the EU, in Mexico, in China, and elsewhere. Um, and in all of these laws that have come in to address the the uh, you know infringing content that is available online, there's there's part of it that says that there shouldn't be this monitoring, this automatic monitoring. But then at the same time, the laws effectively, even if it's only implicitly, require the laws or, or countries to start putting those laws in place. Yes, exactly. So um, I, in, the, in the chapter, I address how the, uh, the online platforms from uh, public forums for, uh, from, uh, for, of, from uh, public spaces where users exchange information, exchange content, um, exchange uh, videos um, with each other, how these platforms, due to this uh, legislative framework, they turn to be tools of censorship. So for instance, um, there, as I address in my chapter, there are similar, there are laws in, in Mexico and in, in, in India and in China, um, that on the one hand it, they say that and in Europe too, uh, with the copyrights and the digital single market direct, that say that well, general monitoring obligation is prohibited. But on the other hand, they uh, require from the platforms to prevent the reemergence of this uh, of infringing content. So um, in that way, they, uh, the the platforms they either, either need to deploy human moderators, human reviewers, or resort 
to uh, filtering tools, to the so-called upload filters. And that was actually the case uh, in Europe with the copyright in the digital single market directive with Article 17. Uh, that was at the beginning, it was called Ar Article 13, and then it turned to be well, Article it changed, 17. Yeah. It's like Chris. It just it's, it's the article formerly known as Chris. <laughs> yes, and uh, it took like uh, two, more than two years to finalize that directive. Um, that on the one hand, if you have a look at Article 17, it states that general monitoring obligations are prohibited, and then it says in paragraph four that uh, the, the online content sharing service providers they need to demonstrate that they make the best efforts to prevent the availability of infringing content. So in order to avoid liability, um, most of the platforms, they might resort to, they resort to these upload filters. And of course, um, the problem with all these upload filters is the fact that they, they, they cannot differentiate between lawful and unlawful co uh, content. No, so you, you talk about this in the chapter, don't you, about you know, they, they, for example, they don't recognize exceptions. And we had joining us um, last year, uh, an, uh, Ben Marsh, who is a, 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 he's an academic at the University of Kent, but he's also made a lot of parody songs with his family that he made during the lockdown, the Marsh family. Um, they, and, and they were, they found in the first instance that their videos were being taken down off YouTube because they were considered to be infringing. And, you know, it, it, it took a lot of effort to actually get them reinstated to start with, because, you know, it, it, you, you need that human intervention, don't you, to get that to happen. And I think you talk in the chapter about, you know, how many, how many potentially, you know, uh, there are items that are up there legitimately, but people have to make quite a lot of effort to get them reinstated. Yes, exactly. So, um, uh, for because of this lack of accuracy, there are so many um, videos, uh, lawful videos, that are removed from the platforms. Um, that uh, they should have been, <laughs> they should have been removed because they fall within the copyright exceptions, like parodies. Um, I, I give some examples in, in, in the chapter. So there was also um, a, um, there was also an example with a professor from Harvard that uploaded a lecture on YouTube, and this was removed. But uh, due to, uh, because of educational purposes, this should have been removed. So the system, the filtering tool, didn't manage to differentiate between uh, what is lawful and what is unlawful, and um, all this overblocking in that has um, that is created, but by, by from this from these filtering tools is also demonstrated in uh, has been evidence also during the pandemic, uh, where 11 million videos. Um, it was um, in April uh, between April and June 2020. 11 million videos have been removed, and then from YouTube, and then 300 uh, 320,000 have been. Uh, appeals so the users they uh, submitted a counter notification for erroneous yeah. removal of the content and half of them they have been reinstated back to the platform so um, the use of filtering technology for sure does not doesn't fails to differentiate to distinguish between lawful and uh, unlawful content mm. yes clearly an issue so uh, what I'm interested to know is we've had the changes that have come through in the EU with the Digital Single Market Directive and other leg legislation around the world, that, that is designed to change uh, the availability of content online. Rights holders have been making their case that they, they feel that this is a, a, an issue for them and, and the way in which they run their businesses. Are we yet seeing an impact on what the, the way information is made available I, I, are we seeing an increase in things being taken down or more platforms being subject to this or is it too early in that process to know if there's actually had that impact uh, that we, we're fearing well, there is already a lot there. Uh, with regard to the filters, of course, there is already uh, many examples, many cases that um, evidence this um, uh, high margin of errors that the filtering tools are are um, are having. But um, with regard, for instance, to Europe, uh, most of, now most of the member states, EU member states, have implemented the directive. Um, 
of course, the, the, the deadline was on the 7th of June 2021, and most of the member states they implemented later. There are still ongoing processes, so there are still uh, member states that haven't implemented. So I assume that probably in the near future we'll see increasing uh, more cases, higher cases of uh, all these uh, erroneous removals of, um, of lawful content online. Yeah, so we have to watch this space. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm keen to, to bring oh, David in on a... Oh, sorry, Zoe, did you have another thing you wanted to mention? Yes, I just wanted also to add with regard to... Uh, there was uh, the case uh, um, about Article 17, about the annulment action of Poland against uh, the Parliament and uh, the, uh, the Council about arguing that Article 17 is not compatible with freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the Advocate General, in the opinion, uh, clearly stated that the, the, all these filtering tools could be a convincing option for identifying copyright infringements due to the um, inability of the human moderators to uh, review all this content that is disseminated online. So we can see also that there is um, a judicial level, um, there is like an open door for these filtering tools, but of course, objecting to uh, the principles of proportionality. Mm. Okay, mm. good, great. Um, so yeah, David, I wanted to bring you in, as I, as I just said, the, the changes in, in the EU, and you've been talking about it, it's, it's a major once in a generation reboot of uh, limitations and exceptions. Um, so are there other impacts that you see coming on the way that libraries and educational institutions and, and cultural and um, heritage institutions actually operate? Are there things that you're thinking, excellent, we can now get on with this job, making these things more available, our collections and, uh, and serving our, our communities, or are there additional challenges that come with this new legislative uh, framework? I, don't, I think we need more clarity on, um, on access, on digital access. Um, I think it needs to be made clear that I think th these things that have been happening in the courts and uh, initiatives that IFLA are proposing, such as you know, own to loan ratio, CDL, that kind of thing, that these are actually um, uh, enshrined in, in law, basically, so that people know that there's a baseline they can operate off. Uh, so I would think uh, the, the European Union itself seems to be, doesn't seem to, it seems to, it seems to start off classifying things and then moving like back in 2001 now 2019 with the dsn directive trying to pick on specific things that are if you like hot and and try and deal with them uh, uh so uh, i'm thinking possibly it might need to to look at where it needs to coordinate a bit more to give people more confidence as to where they can operate uh you know there's still that tension between uh, publishers, and I'm not even sure that it's uh, the problem is with the rights holders. I think the problem is more with publishers. Publishers have so much control over over the way they. A lot of what, what we've been talking about now uh, uh, is, is relates to very exceptional types of circumstances. The reality for most libraries is they're dealing with uh, you know uh, big deals, you know, uh, the e-journals and that kind of thing, and those are very very specific licensing uh, issues. Um, and a lot of the response to that has been uh, like at you know academic level at library level has been to try and push open access um, and similarly uh, with textbooks to have like some kind of a, a way of mediating resources to students that's not dependent on very expensive uh, uh, published resources so uh, I, 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 what, what law can do I don't know very, very often times you can't for example get the law to tell academics to stop publishing uh, with uh, Classical publishers and go open access um, uh, practices are really what 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 uh, what uh, what evolved there. So if I was to sort of say if you what, what can the law do? What can Europe do? What the European Union do in particular? I would suggest maybe it's time for some kind of a directive specifically on on digital access to take that formula that they've used in the past that they, they fixed on very very early about you know just technology changing and really there's no difference between analog and digital. Uh, they're just formats. Uh, and to, to find some way of, of um, expressing in terms that people understand how we can actually now set the rules so that, say, with the digital access thing, you know, dedicated terms is almost like a meaningless term now uh, in some ways. Uh, uh, like, you know, what can you do? In, 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 how, what, do, you do what controls do you have to introduce uh, to, say, limit access to a document uh, 
on the internet that 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 fits with the the, the legislation i mean very often times european like like copyright law is about balancing interests so you really do have to respect the rights of of, of the the right holder you can't just willingly allow things to be distributed over the internet for free uh, just because say 20 years ago we thought everything was about cooperation and freedom uh no it, it is there really are uh, interests to be protected so uh, the legislation i think needs now to find a way of you know how do we express these specific how do we codify these specific issues in such ways that that libraries can go ahead and say we want to digitize and make things available mm. it's a it's, a, it's a, a point that reminds me of one of the things that came up in the conversation with Corey Doctorow uh, about whether copyright really is the issue that we're talking about so if you're talking about is there mm. something the EU can do more generally on access to collections because the conversation about copyright is is about how fast the windscreen wipers are going not necessarily about where the car's going on the journey that's his yeah that's his metaphor yeah um, and i'm keen to to uh, to ask zoe if we if we're thinking about what libraries and education institutions are doing i, I mean are the things around filtering technologies going to have an impact or or, or are they really so heavily focused on the consumer facing social media platforms that that anything that a university is doing for example in its virtual learning environment is totally separate to that or is there a potential concern well there is a concern to where uh, because this all these filtering tools could also be used from from libraries um, and this could also be um, the risks. Um, it's it's already uh, it would be very useful to already identify all these discrepancies that the all these uh, margins of errors that uh, these filtering tools uh, might perform. Uh, because I think also um, that um, the access to creativity um, it could be could be violated. Um, the, the access of the the users' fundamental rights, the freedom of expression, could be violated. So, uh, with all these um, erroneous removals of uh, lawful content, so this could also these filtering tools, these filtering technologies, software systems, they could also be uh, applicable also in the library, in light in the library's context. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about um, we had on one of our previous webinars. Uh, Peter Yazi and Meredith Jacob uh, and, and Will Cross um, from uh, based in the US who've created um, a code of best practice in fair use for open educational resources, mm. uh, which is great. And there's you know a, a, a Canadian uh, version in 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 the pipeline, um, and we're also keen to see how that might apply to UK law. Similarly, it's it's a thing that we see a great value in having. Uh, in, in many different jurisdictions, because I think there's a basic sense of what is fair, whether it's fair dealing, fair use or any of the other limitations and exceptions regimes. But if you're talking about open resources that are out there, it's not the same as thinking, OK, well, it's all in a virtual learning environment. It's within our own registration wall. We don't need to worry about the copyright implications. Yeah. As soon as there is, as David just saying, you know, push towards open access and open education, if that movement is kind of going in one direction mm. and then you've got the legislation and all the platforms that actually people access. It's going to really it's hamper going, people's the, ability to rely on yeah, exceptions, isn't it? The, 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 that educational impact of it is not just about a parody and, and, yeah. and, and something that's a bit, a bit of fun. This is fundamentally important to be able to incorporate things into resources that are increasingly going to be openly shared and expectation and actually a desirable thing for them to be open. So. There is a real tension there, isn't there? Indeed, yes. Um, like the uh, exactly. So the, how this filtering, how this uh, software technology, filtering technology, would be able to um, identify whether that, um, for instance, content that uh, article is in the public domain. There might be, uh, and this actually, this this that I was addressing before, like the difficulty of these filtering tools to differentiate between uh, copyright exceptions and uh, and lawful content. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really key. Um, Zoe, could you could you just sort of maybe a, a kind of key? What's your kind of key message for? So we've got a lot of copyright specialists, librarians on the on the webinar today. Have you got kind of a key takeaway other than just say you know a plug for your chapter to tell them to read it? But <laughs> what, <laughs> any any sort of key message? Um, so, for instance, with regard to the filtering tools, um, just um, there is a need for uh, 
And this is something now that is happening with the implementation of uh, the directive of uh, Article 17 of the directive into EU member states to um, to um, use ex ante uh, safeguards for uh, users' yeah. uh, fundamental rights. Uh, that is, uh, I think, a key. Uh, one of the key solutions, the key recommendations in order to um, avoid or to mitigate any risks for uh, users' fundamental rights, for the right to freedom of expression, and the right to arts, uh, to our, the right to freedom of arts and sciences. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, that's something I'm sure lots of librarians will get behind, freedom of speech. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David, if I can go over to you, have you got uh, any any sort of key takeaways from, from your chapter? You, any messages you think, you know, that, that are really important for the library and copyright specialists on the call? Oh, David, you're on mute. <laughs> First time I had to say that. Yeah, it's less about law and more about practice. Uh, I, I think that really, uh, whether you're involved in research, teaching or special collections like I am, uh, there's always going to be some resources in your collections that you want to digitise. And I think you really should be not put off about doing that. I mean, you have to be discriminating because uh, obviously it's self-limiting. You can't digitise everything, otherwise you're replicating the publishing industry in the first. You know, that's just not practical. But there are obviously ways of getting uh, content to, to, to readers, to users. That are enhanced by digitizing certain of your resources and, and i really think it's a that that's a core thing that the library should be loving for that that we have a right to do this it's yeah. not specifically expressed in in law it's kind of indirectly expressed through the court of justice but as far as you know university libraries go it's not quite all there yet and we the university libraries need a bit more clarity we're not going to go mm. running off um, uh, digitizing like whole collections you're not allowed to anyway uh, no. uh, but there are things that you want to do and you know that just segments, uh, certain collections, say pamphlets, for instance, things like that, you know. Uh, so I would right, say, yeah. yeah, go ahead and tr try out those projects and, and, and uh, talk to each other. And uh, if anybody kind of comes down like a ton of bricks and you uh, see what you can do, see if you can take the, the approach that you Darmstadt took, which is take a test case. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mm -hmm. think and that's a, that's a message that we're always trying to to uh, repeat and to make very clear that, that copyright maybe have complexity in it, mm. um, uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't do things no. uh, with That's copyright right. protected material. Can I say yeah. one last thing? I, I said I, I said a lot yeah. there, and 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 these things are, are obviously these are not. This is not legal advice. I'm not giving legal advice. <laughs> I, mean, I just have to say that because you, you asked me you asked me what's the takeaway, what would I recommend, and and you know you know I'm, it's really talking to colleagues here is something are very are very risk averse they won't go down those routes uh but yeah. others are, are prepared to go down, the, down that route so it's it's really all on the individual institution concerned but like i say talk to each other when you're doing it yeah Excellent. definitely yeah, definitely really um has anyone in the audience anyone want to ask anything i just put it in the chat if you want to raise your hand or you want to ask any questions but i know we've got Quite a lot of you here so we've got a couple of minutes if there's anyone if we can get david's lights back on yeah. so if while well, gathering your thoughts it's it's yeah i think uh, the the thing that i i i took from and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of wrap it for a bit until yeah. we see if anyone's got a question um that, that as i as we've been saying that there's quite a lot of detail in it and i think that um having the the book and those chapters is a really useful guide for us if we need to go in and find the reference points that we have to the various bits of legislation they're very clearly laid out so i think it's a uh, it's a really uh, excellent resource mm. um both, both chapters actually both, i, I yeah. learned lots of things reading both of them it kind of yeah i liked i, I learned a lot, a lot about how filtering technologies worked and um you know kind of i think when you're thinking about AI and how clever it's getting, you know, it's still kind of, you. I ended up concluding at the end, you know, well, however clever, you know, technology is going to get, surely we always need, you know, when it comes to making a judgment on copyright matters. We still need human beings for the time being. For the time being. Is there, is there a point when this whole webinar will just simply be a load of robots talking to each other because <laughs> they've actually far exceeded our ability to maybe, uh, to make maybe. sense of this thing. maybe no but david i found your chapter as well just like not it, it, the way you kind of went through everything sequentially and i was like, oh yeah so that's where it all started with the infosoc directive which you know i've i've 
uh, I've read a lot about things, but but to have it all condensed in that chapter was was really was really great actually, and to bring it right up to date as well with with what's happening. So nobody nobody's coming up with any questions. No, so I think you've you've uh, you've basically um, done such a good job, both of you, and really great to have you join us this morning. So. And, and the great thing about plugging the book, of course, is it's open access. It's free. Everyone can access it and must immediately go and download. Uh, Certainly, the two chapters, well, the three chapters we've mentioned today. Yes. Um, yes. And yes. Uh, yeah, thank chapter you. 13 that didn't hasn't been renamed actually no. at all, no, has it? It, hasn't, no, it no. wasn't a previously known as chapter 17, and it got no, no. The chapter that nearly killed us. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> let's go back to our slides, shall we? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank David you both so much. Yeah. Us. Yeah. It's um, really great to meet you. Hey, Chris, that was a lot of fun. Have any Thank you so much. later questions, anything they pick up in your chapter, presumably you'd be happy to kind of answer any questions that anyone has separately. I'm putting you on the spot. Absolutely. <laughs> of course, yes. Of course. Excellent. Excellent. So yeah, much. well we will we will we'll be making these slides available with the links and uh, uh, yeah, we'll we'll have a recording up soon, hopefully, for everyone. <laughs> so just quickly before we go, um, then uh, we've got some future webinars coming up. So um, Navigating Copyright Part 2 is mm -hmm. going to be on the 2nd of December. And we are able to uh, reveal that we've got three speakers, three speakers. For that now. We have one of the editors of the books. Um, the book, Jessica Coates, is joining us from Australia. So she's looking forward to the, the so it's going to be in, party. It's going to be in the morning still, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. It is going to be at 11 o'clock. It'll be evening. It's going to be the... evening for her. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, That's yeah, all yeah. Clear. yeah. Yes. Uh, we've also got Tom uh, Cochran, who's from uh, Queensland uh, Institute of Technology. No, is that what it's called? Yes. Um, You're on your own with this one. Yeah, and we've got Stephen Weiber from IFLA as well joining us, uh, 2nd of December. Uh, don't forget, Date for Your Diaries, the Christmas special. We have a very special treat coming up for you. Um, it will probably involve fun and games and not a huge amount of copyright um, law. We'll see. But we'd, who knows? We haven't finalised exactly what's no, going on. No, 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 no. So, um, and uh, yeah, you put my birthday special. We yes. haven't got a topic for we it. We haven't yet. got a topic. Well, we just make it all about you, <laughs> if you like. Um, Yes, excellent. So, hopefully you can join us on those ones. Yeah, hopefully. Um, and yeah. then, uh, I sh shall we stop the recording now? No, it's We're all, gonna it's one on. last thing. Okay, you're one gonna, last you're thing. You're not going to play the jingle, are you, then? Not the one last thing jingle, because mm -hmm. I think that's probably going to be too much. Yeah, um, okay. So, yeah, thank you again for all of you that joined us. Uh, here is our one last thing, right? We are going to give this one a go and see if we can actually get this uh, set up for you. Uh, I'm gonna, you're gonna you're, you're gonna get a takedown we are i think uh, i would stop it I well would. are we gonna get a takedown okay who this, knows? this is is this a third? It's an original work uh, it's it's been copyright checked by the filters That's this true. one yeah okay. so we're going to share with you the song that was composed commemorating our conversation with cory dr um so uh, this is the point at which we say please don't leave but you know Clearly, you're, 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 you can leave if you want to. Um, <laughs> we are going to share. I think I'll share a window, haven't share you? Share a, application share screen. Share application screen. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a Chrome tab. It's going to be that this one. one. Um, we're going to get it to the point where it's we've got past the advert. Yep. Everyone's yeah, enjoying this, but let me just, OK. We're OK, here we go. There. Go, go, share, share. Hold on a sec. There's probably no audio. Right. Now we might get horrible feedback here, but let's give it a go anyway. Mr. <laughs> Cory Doctor Rose. He knows about the lot you know. Monopolistic power of use. And copyright in farming tools. Mr. Cory Dr. Rose, a sci fi copyright hero. He fills his fridge with groceries, but gives his work away for free. Mr. Cory Dr. Rose. 
He joined us on our podcast show. He told us how he changed his mind. How being PRM inclined. Mr. Corey Dr. The way he talks is not so slow. His book with Rebecca Gibbon. <laughs> Got your point capital is in Mr. Corey Dr. Rowe <laughs> What more do you need to know? Nothing. Check out the podcast and his books And his pluralistic blog is good Wow, well, well, there thanks we go. for bearing with us. <laughs> um, I think at that point, if we will stop the recording, thank you for joining us. Oh, I missed, you missed the credits. I missed the credits, didn't I? <laughs>